Hi everybody, in this next chapter we're going to be covering the topic of language in two parts. The first part will talk about the rules of language and whether or not animals actually have language in the way that we think about it. And part two will look at parts of speech and also uh, the critical period of language development. So what is the definition of language? Webster talks about it as being an expression of communication of thoughts, feelings, or meanings of sounds and combinations of such sounds to which meaning is attributed human speech. But what about other things that we do that are communicating? Uh, shrugging, um, signing, writing, all of these things are communicating with one another, but is, is it actually language? Well, we use language for lots of different things, and this is just a few of the many things. We use it to relieve nervous energy, like when you say, ouch, when you stub your toe, even though nobody else is in the room, so you're not really communicating with anyone. And we also use it to control reality. One example would be um, wedding vows, where prior to saying, I do, you're single. Once you say, I do, then you are married. So that is actually making a commitment by using language. Another example would be if you are a witness on the witness stand, prior to you putting your hand on the Bible and, and saying you're going to tell the truth, prior to that, whatever you say is of your own volition. After that, you are committing perjury if you lie. Language also is used to maintain social ties. Even we don't really expect anybody to respond. So it's when you walk down the hallway and say, how's it going? You don't really expect anybody to come up and say, well, I'm having lots of problems today. It's just a matter of trying to be polite and, and, and sometimes you just nod at them and they nod back. It's also a way to recognize identity. Um, like I put Thor in here because he has this sort of regal voice and you know that he comes from a line of royalty which is a much different sound than if somebody is using speaking that sounds more slang-like. So the question is, we use language as an instrument of thought or do we not? And everybody can probably relate to this idea where you have this sort of inner dialogue going on. The example I put here is when I go to the parking structure and I'm thinking in my head, where did I park the car? Where did I park the car? This is a running dialogue in my head, although I'm not actually saying anything. So most people report that they think in words like this. And so John Watson actually started um, thinking about language as being sub vocal speech, um, an idea that was later refuted because you can be thinking and not necessarily be thinking in, in words. So are language and thought synonymous, meaning is, is, is one just like the other? And probably not. There are some things that we think about that um, you really can't put into words. There are several listed here, but one that we have talked about in class before is if I ask you to describe your mother's face, it's very difficult to put a facial description into words because we normally don't think about it in words. Another would be asking someone to describe music. And if I ask you to describe your favorite music, people will say things like it's mellow, it's beboppy, it's smooth, but none of those things really get you to the point where the person can hear the music in and of itself. So language and thought seem to be somewhat um, separate, but also are interdependent. So this idea of lingu linguistic relativism is this idea that thought shapes language and language shapes thought. So they've done experiments where people have been asked to argue against their actual viewpoint on something. And after they have constructed an argument and had to argue for something that they don't agree with, they start to agree with it a little bit more. So it's this idea that what I say influences how I think and what I think influences it, what I say. So this is called the Saphir Whorf hypothesis, which is that language and thought are interdependent. So when we think about the nature of language and it being human language, Hockett came up 
with these rules, if you will, or design features that he said are a requirement for human language. And we're going to think about these different um, rules of language when we review the animal communication systems. So there are lots of different communication systems, anything from bird song to um, scent marking, which has to do with pheromones and different sort of mating rituals. And these communication systems, um, although they are a means to an end for the, the individual species, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have language in the way that we think about language as being human. So the different design features, when you think about Hockett, he are listed here. I wouldn't hold you responsible for this, but this is just an example where you can see that there are all different types of um, requirements for language upon the left. And you can see that these other sort of communications along the right, depending on the um, animal or insect involved, doesn't necessarily meet all of Hockett's design features. So there have been a variety of studies to try to teach um, monkeys specifically to speak. And so I'm just going to go through a few of them. Um, the first one, and there's a link at the top if you're interested in looking at this. Back in the 50s, this couple um, adopted this chimp when she was a baby, named her Vicky, and raised her alongside of their son, Donald. And so they were raised as siblings. But after four years, Vicky could only say sort of four words. Um, whereas, of course, Donald could speak fluent English. So this was the idea that we can raise um, a monkey in the same way as a human, and they still are not able to, to speak language. And if you're to listen to this little videotape, you can hear that, that the monkey is saying something, but it doesn't sound like mama, papa, cup, or up. That's just what the hazes heard because they really, really wanted this to work. And that's called a demand characteristic, if you remember from previous courses. So next along came um, researchers looking uh, to teach this animal Washu to, um, to communicate. And instead of trying to use spoken language, they use sign language. And after four years, it seems that he could sign about 130 signs similar to a two-year-old. However, um, it, it didn't seem that he had any syntax in his um, signing. And the, the interesting thing was, is that he actually did seem to learn something, but it needed to be validated. Um, so along comes um, Georgia State, where they actually raised um, a variety of monkeys, Lana and, and Kanzi specifically, and they ended up being really smart animals. And what they had them do is learn this little keyboard that you can see on the bottom left um, that had a bunch of icons on it. And those icons were um, associated with different meanings that the animals had to learn and they could construct rudimentary sentences with it. So it suggested that they could learn as well. So later on, um, Herb Terrence, he decided to conduct a double blind um, test of whether or not these animals um, could learn to speak and were actually learning sign language in the way that a human being would. So after having some grad students train up Nim, they videotaped him and then they showed this videotape of Nim to um, experts in American Sign Language. And what the results showed is that it didn't seem that Nim actually learned anything. He was just um, doing rote responses um, based on some so sort of reward system. So when they were watching this videotape, the monkey was signing banana nim, more nim banana, eat banana nim, and he just kept signing until he got a reward. So he didn't really understand what he was doing. He just associated these signs with getting rewarded. So this is similar to operant conditioning. And then finally, um, Francine Patterson raised um, Coco, who was the subject of some Seinfeld episodes, if you want to Google that, it was really funny. And 
she tried to teach Coco to teach um, to to sign as well. He was able to make some novel sentences where he could sign white and tiger together to stand for zebra. However, the ga the grammar was very limited, so it suggested that he was not able to um, speak or communicate um, better than the previous attempts at teaching animals. So the question is, do animals have language? And it depends on who you ask. Uh, the current view is that animal language is different than human language, and animal language has evolutionary roots um, in humans, very rudimentary. And it seems that maybe animals um, can receive and understand language like we found out at the Language Research Center. However, their production and the tracks and the way that their mouth is shaped is not conducive to um, vocalized human speech.